Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Kevin Cosby here at St. Stephen Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, with another powerful point to ponder. Why? Because we have covenanted to spend meaningful moments with the Master as we unpack God's Word. This entire week we've been in a series entitled No Fear, K-N-O-W. 365 times in the Bible you find the expression, fear not. Fear not. For every day of your life, there's a fear not for you. And in order to really uh, experience that fear not, you have to know fear, know something about fear, know what causes us to be afraid, and know what the six basic fears are, uh, like a fear of uh, the future, fear of commitment, uh, fear of failure, fear of loneliness. And today, here is a primal fear that all of us have to deal with, and that is the fear of death. That's the fifth fear we want to talk about, the fear of death. Listen to Psalm 31, verses 14 and 15. It says, but I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies for those who pursue me. I think the lesson of this verse is simply this, that your times are in the hands of God. You know, there's uh, something that you can pull up called www.deathclock.com. www.deathclock.com. And if you answer the questions, www.deathclock.com can tell you or purports to be able to tell you when you're going to die. So they'll ask you when you're born, how old you, know, how old you are, they'll ask you some health questions. And then they will do some tabulations and then project to you when you probably are going to die, what year, around what year, what month. They, that, that's deafclock.com. Well, who knows? This week we celebrate the birthday of a woman who is 116 years old. Who knows? One thing we do know is this. Is this right? The writer says, but I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God, my times are in your hands. I know some people who've had stage four cancer and they're still going. I know some people who've been dialysis and they're still going. And I know some people who are a picture of health and they're no longer with us because our times are in God's hands. Now, death is inevitable. <coughs> Excuse me. We cannot cheat death. David did not say in the 23rd Psalms, nay, or no, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He said, yea, or yes, I do walk through the valley of the shadow of death. David also told his friend Jonathan, the son of King Saul, there's just one step between me and death. In other words, my next moment might be my last moment because uh, Jonathan's father, Saul, was trying to kill him. And in this, this age of of, of a pandemic, we never know. We can practice um, uh, good disciplines uh, as the CDC has asked us to do, but you just never know who can contract it and what impact that COVID may have on an individual if they do contract it. So there is a great fear of death, fear of death. Why do we exercise so much? We exercise because we want to keep our bodies healthy because we are afraid that we're going to die. Why do we um, put on makeup and uh, dye our hair and all other things to hide the gray because we do not want to be reminded of the fact that we are aging and with aging comes decline and the death of our body. Now death is inevitable and it's universal and it's democratic. Not every family will own a car. Not every family will own a house. Not every family will have a college graduate. But every family will have death come visit it. Every family will have death come visit. No family will miss death because death misses no family. You know, when death does come, um, how we respond to death is predicated on who it was that dies. Every person dies 
but not all deaths are the same. Some deaths that will take place are deaths that will cause a sense of relief. And then there's some deaths that will occur that feel, make us feel a sense of regret. What do I mean? Uh, when my father died in 2014, uh, he had been sick for some time. And he was laying in the bed in the, and often in the hospital and sick. And um, I hated to see my dad like that. So then when he passed away, I grieve, and I still grieve, and I miss him dearly. He was my number one cheerleader. I mean, I had a great father. But when he passed, I had a sense of relief because I knew that this was not really living. This was existing to be in that bed all the time. So somebody in your family passes and you're feeling like, you know, it's a sense of relief. And some of you may even be feeling guilty. You no, know, why do I feel relief? Well, in a sense, you've already grieved their death even before they expired because they were not the person that you have known. So you had what's called anticipatory grief. You dealt with their actual death prior to their actual death. It was anticipatory grief. And that type of death uh, is a death that brings a sense of relief that they're no longer suffering. But there's also death that will visit family and it will not be responded to as relief. It will be responded to as a regret. Kobe Bryant, it's not release or relief. That's a regret. In our own city, someone, uh, we don't know what was triggered it, probably gang related, but shot up a house and it happened last week. And guess who was in that house? A three-year-old girl. Now our city here in Louisville, Kentucky is grieving the death of a three-year-old girl. Is that relief? No, that's regret. And when it's regret, we grieve, we hurt because it's like an emotional amputation that has taken place. Now, let me say something to you about death that is the most liberating thing I can say to myself and the most liberating thing you can say to yourself to help you deal with anxiety about death. Here it is. You've got to say this. I am going to die. I am going to die. And the minute you can honestly tell yourself, you know what? I am going to die. That does not paralyze you. The fact that you're going to die does not paralyze you. It energizes you. And the reason the fact of death, knowing you're going to die, energizes you is because you know that life is precious and you do not waste time, the limited time we have on trivialities. Psalm 90, verse 9, 10, and 12 reads, we live our lives beneath your wrath ending our years with the groan, and we will end our years with groaning, with pain and death. Seventy years are given to us. Some even live to 80 and beyond, like the woman whose birthday we celebrated here in Louisville, or nationally rather, last week, who's 116, 116 years old. We live, uh, some of us even live to be 80, or for, in her case, 116 years old. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble, soon they disappear, we fly away. So he says, since we only have 70, 80, 90 years, he says, teach us to realize the brevity of life so we may grow in wisdom. In other words, teach us to realize we don't have a lot of time to de be dealing with things that really don't matter. It helps us to prioritize, it energizes us and say, you know what? I've got to do the works of him who has sent me while it is day for the night cometh when no man works. It helps us to do what the psalmist said and when he says, whatever thy hand 
uh, or the writer of Ecclesiastes, rather, who says, whatever thy hands finds to do, do it with all thy might, for there is no work in the grave. There's no work in the grave. There's only work in life. So whatever you're going to do, do it now. And then when death comes, because we believe in the resurrection, we have a promise from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. And this is what it says. We are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body at home with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Let me tell you what death is like. Imagine a pregnant woman. She's in her ninth month. Suppose you could talk to the child that's in the mother. The child is alive, but the child is in limited space. So you could say to the child, child, guess what? You've got to leave that environment. You've got to leave that world, that the only world you know. And the child will say, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to leave this world. It's the only world I know. How do I know there's a world outside the womb? You talk to the child and say, now let me ask you a question. If there was no world outside the womb, why are you growing hands? You're growing hands not to reach in, to, into something inside the womb because there's nothing to reach for. Why are you growing legs? You're growing legs not to walk inside the womb because there's no space to walk. Why are you growing eyes? You, you're not growing eyes to see inside the womb because there's nothing in the womb because there's nothing to see. So if you're growing hands and growing legs and growing eyes inside the womb, that must mean that you're developing something inside the womb to, that you're going to take advantage of on the outside. Outside the womb, there's something to walk on called earth. There's something to see and there's something to grab. And guess what? Right now, we are in this world called time. It's a limited womb. But in this limited womb called time, God is developing us spiritually for something beyond this world, and that is called heaven. And God is getting us ready for heaven. Paul said, to be away from my body is to be at home with the Lord. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Help us to say, I am going to die. Not that it will paralyze us, but it will energize us to do those things that glorify your name and make our world better. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today on another powerful point to ponder. If you don't have a church home, we invite you to become a part of the St. Stephen's uh, online community, the St. Stephen online church. Uh, contact us here at St. Stephen Church at info at sclive.org. And as we say every day, stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands, stay safe, stay sane, and if you can, stay home. See you tomorrow.